guys. So we're going to Skype in with my friend Ariel, who's studying evolutionary biology down here in St. Augustine, which is like she's on the coast of Florida, but she's actually, uh, that's just where they're like staying. She's actually off these little islands that are off to the sides that you probably still can't even see. Probably like these little guys over in here. So it's, it's a really beautiful area, and they have a whole blog that the researchers have put out. One of their head researchers was actually a biology teacher, well, a whole science teacher, and has this whole idea that students need to be connecting more with what science is and what science does and should be connecting more with scientists. So it's a really great opportunity. Like, not many scientists are just like, yeah, I'll take time out of my busy scientist day to interact with a bunch of science students in high school who may or may not ever even be scientists or may or may not even be interested in science. So it's a really awesome opportunity that they're giving us here. So we're gonna go ahead and Skype them in and uh, see what we get. Her name is Ariel. You may or may not recognize her last name. What's that? Yep. So we'll, we'll see if we can get her here. Her sister. Make sure you guys have your questions ready and are ready to talk to her. Let's see what's up. Oh no, I was just trying to find her. Oh, trying to see where you are. Just where you are. Hey guys. Hey, how's it going, Ariel? Good, one second. I have to label a bag. I just follow up with Okay. Do you think? I'll find the flashlight so you can see the kids. Okay, cool. Um, I, I just want to see them already. All right. Let's see. I need to find a shady spot. Maybe I'll put it right here. I guess I'll do, I guess I'll do intros while she's finding a spot. Guys, this is Ariel. Ariel, this hey, is my eighth period class, and some of my third period class, they're all... Uh, biology, mostly sophomores, a couple freshmen. Everybody say hi to Ariel. Hi, Ariel. Hi. Hey. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I actually was sitting in right where you guys were about 10 years ago. Um, and now I am a grad student at the University of Virginia. Um, I am studying evolutionary biology. And I got a hold of Scott because right now I'm out doing some field work and thought it'd be fun to Skype you guys into the field and just kind of show you what, uh, what it's like to be a field biologist. Um, so, we are here in, on an island in the Matanzas River, which is in St. Augustine, Florida. Um, I'll kind of pan around. It's kind of covered with cedars, there's some palm trees. Um, and this is one of um, several islands that are on the, on the river that are part of an experiment. Oh, there's a big male. Oh, he's marching. Uh, I'm like, there are like lizards running all around. There's a... Uh, a big, an experiment that is being done uh, by Dan Warner, who is at uh, University of Alabama, Birmingham. And um, one of my lab mates has been collaborating with him, and I'm tagging along for the trip to um, do a selection analysis on some of the li lizards here. So um, Mr. Patterson told me that you guys have just recently finished learning about natural selection, right? Yes. Right. Uh, cool. So, um, one of the things that I, I think I always thought of uh, with evolution when I was learning about it was that it was done by people in museums and they were looking at fossils and older, you know, someone in the Smithsonian, but really evolutionary biologists now spend a lot of time in the field uh, because we want to understand how evolution occur is occurring in populations currently. And one of the ways to do that is by looking at how populations are experiencing selection. And so what we're doing out here is using lizards as um, our organism, we can, um, we can look at selection over the course of years by coming out several times a year, catching all the lizards or as many as we can on each island, um, weighing them, measuring them, um, and then seeing who, is, who stays around um, each year. So if you're a lizard on the island at the beginning of the year but you die by the end, then we say like they were they were selected against because they didn't make it through the season. So, um, and then we do this over the course of the year. So let me grab a lizard to show you guys what these guys look like. Um, this, the species that we're studying is the brown anole. And uh, males and females are pretty uh, dimorphic, which means that males, are, males and females look different from one another. Um, let me open one of the bins. Eh. So, 
for example, I'm going to call this male out. So males of the species are generally about 30 times larger than females. So this is a male lizard. He is, uh, he's got, uh, he's pretty big, and he's got a big dewlap, which I'll, let me see if I can prop up the phone. So he's got this dewlap that he can extend out when, to display to other lizards. So he'll pop that out when he sees a female or sees another male and they're having territorial um, conflicts. And in comparison, here's a female. Oops. Sorry, I'm trying to like put my phone on the cooler. So here's a male and here's a female. So males are huge compared to the females, right? Um, so these lizards uh, are live uh, usually, I think, about a year. So every year, only about 20% of the lizards live, which gives us a really um, good opportunity to measure selection because we don't have to wait for several years to see who lives and who dies. We can do it every year. Only about 20% of them live. And we can look and see, do, are the big males the ones that live? Are the male, or are the females who have you know, specific traits? Are they, like the females who are big and fat, are they the ones that live? Um, and so on and so forth. So that's how we um, measure natural selection, which remember is just selection for um, survival. So let me just put these guys back in their bags really quick. Um, so the other thing that um, we can look at with all these islands, and this is what my lab mate um, Aaron and I are doing, is looking at how uh, sexual selection. So sexual selection is a little bit different because it's um, we're looking at who is reproducing more. So what we're doing is coming out at the beginning of the season and catching all of the animals and doing the same things. We're weighing them you know, and measuring how long they are, looking at their dewlaps. But then we're seeing, we're coming back in the summer when all of the little hatchlings are out and catching all the hatchlings. And we, when we collect all the lizards, we also take a DNA sample. So we've got DNA from all of the parents at the beginning of the season, and then we'll catch all of the hatchlings and take a DNA sample from them. And then we can do a parentage analysis, which is like, if you guys have ever watched Jerry Springer, it's like the who's your daddy, that, you know. <laughs> so if we have all this DNA, we can look at their DNA and determine who is producing the most babies. And then we can look to see, are big dads producing lots of babies? Are big moms producing a lot of babies? Are there specific characteristics of the lizards that are experiencing sexual selection? to increase that number of, uh, or increase that trait uh, in a population. Um, so I am, so Aaron is lo looking at things that are, um, like characteristics that are more like body size and dewlap size, um, which are usually in lizards, traits that um, help males, for example, acquire territories or acquire mates. Um, so that happens before they mate, right? Well, selection can also occur after animals mate, which sounds kind of weird, right? How can selection, how can males, after they mate with a female, how can they still be under selection? Um, what can happen in lizards is a female can mate with multiple males and actually store their sperm for up to four or five months. So if all of the sperm is in a female at the same time and males are, or and females are gonna be laying eggs every 10 days, there's actually competition between the sperm to fertilize those eggs. And which is what we call sperm competition. So I, that's what I'm interested in. And so I'm out here and I'm collecting sperm from all of the males and looking to see if there are differences in the sperm that even if the males are able to acquire mates, are they experiencing selection after they mate because they have really high quality sperm or maybe they have really low quality sperm and they don't actually produce any offspring. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. yeah. Do you have any questions for me so far? No questions? Caleb had a really good question. Um, hi, I'm yeah. Caleb. Um, so I said, why do you believe lizards are the best organism to study for evolution? That's a really good question. So one of the things, uh, 
like I said before, these lizards only live about a year or two. Um, one of the things that's really tricky about studying evolution is that in order for a change to happen, it happens it has to happen over a generation, right? We can't see animals might um, uh, change slightly based on like their condition. You know, maybe they'll get put on extra. You know, you see your cats or dogs get their winter coat; they can adapt to changing in the changes in the season. But we can't actually see selection happening unless we're looking between generations. And because the generation times in these lizards are only a year, it means that we can study them over you know, five or six years and see selection happening. Um, it also happens that on, so on this island, which is probably the size of two football fields, we've caught over 500 lizards in, a, in you know, a few days. So we have a huge sample size and they're pretty, they're, you know, they're, they're a little squirrely, but they're pretty easy to catch. So, you know, that makes them really great for field work because we can come out here for a week catch all of the lizards, or you know, maybe 90% of the lizards, and get good samples from them, uh, let them go, and uh, come back several times a year and do that. That's a good question. Does anybody else have any questions? How many lizards, no? oh. how many huh. lizards did you grab today? Like how many is in the cooler uh, right now? Let's see, well today we caught, we went onto a different island this morning and we caught about 103, I think, on that island. And here we've been on the, this island for about an hour and a half. Um, and we caught, I don't know, I've caught about 15. Uh, other people are catching. We have uh, four other people are here with me right now. Dan Warner, who is a professor at Alabama. Aaron Reedy, who's a grad student in my lab at uh, UVA. And then um, one of Dan's, or two of Dan's students, one a master's student, one is uh, undergrad. Um, so it's pretty cool uh, to have, you know, field work is really fun because you get to get outside and do some really awesome science, but you also get to hang out with some really smart people and um, really fun people. Um, yeah, let's see. I'm trying to think of other things I can tell you about the lizards. Um, so I can give you a little sense of where we are. Let me see if I can hold you up. So you can see over here, there's a big river right there. That's the Matanzas River. And on the other side of it is um, a, a, a caught, like a kind of land bar that runs all down the coast of uh, Florida. And then on the other side of that is the, um, is the ocean. And, uh, it's uh, so we're pretty close to the ocean, and this water is actually uh, part of an estuary that's um, kind of uh, salt, like saltwater marshy. We saw some manatees this morning and some dolphins and things like that. Um, so I think I'm going to run over here and show you guys how we actually catch the lizards. So the lizards are kind of small, like I showed you, and they hide in this kind of grassy stuff like over there. So it's hard to get at them with your hands. So what we actually use are nooses, um, which are fishing poles with little strings of um, fishing line tied into a noose. Oh, and here, someone, Andrew just caught one. Hey, this is Andrew. Hey guys. And he just caught a lizard on a noose. Uh, so you, can you see the, yeah, so the, the, the um, we make a little tiny noose that's about the size of a quarter and you can just slip it over the lizard and catch them. Um, here he's untangling it, um, and he caught a little female. Little female. Um, so we, <laughs> M21, yeah, so we have, the other thing is that all on these islands, we have all of the trees um, tagged with markers, and so that we can, uh, we, when we catch the lizard, we put them in a plastic bag, which sounds kind of like it would be uncomfortable for them, but they, are do just fine. They can stay in the bags for several days. Then um, we mark on the bag the tree that we caught them and the time we caught them. And uh, it seems the lizards actually seem to stay when we come out and we've caught some of these lizards four or five times. Uh, they seem to stay on the same tree every year. Every time we catch them, they're on M11 or um, you know always on that tree, which is really great because it also means that we can look at how little parts of the island experience selection. So if this part of the island has really great habitat, are the lizards um, experiencing different types of 
uh, selective pressures. So are those maybe lizards maybe surviving better than lizards on the other side of the island where the habitat's not so great? Um, you guys have any questions? Um, yeah, my name's Kyle. I doubt you can see me. But um, what's the ratio between the male and females? Like how many more is the males and females or vice versa? Sorry, could you say that a little louder? I can't hear you. Oh, holler at her. Sorry. Uh, how many, like, which sex has the most uh, in the lizards? Like, is there That's more a males? That's a good question. Yeah. So sex ratio is um, can be really variable in this lizard. Let me get out of the sun so you can see me. So the, um, in these populations, the sex ratio can really vary. And the density, they can be, the density can be about one lizard per meter. And it seems like areas where lizards are in really high density populations, like, or like little um, communities, that the sex ratio is really skewed to females. So it's high quality habitat, there seem to be a lot more females um, in that area, and then a few males who are um, defending those territories. Usually they're really big, strong males who are trying to uh, take over that whole tree or bush. That's the question, but it's pretty variable. So density and sex ratio can vary a lot on these islands. All right, cool, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm Anybody Michelle. Else? Yeah. Um, we actually don't know yet, so that's something that we're hoping to do when we do uh, the parentage analysis that I was talking about. One of the things that we can do uh, when we develop the markers for the DNA is we can look, um, if we develop a lot of them, we can look to see if there are correlations with any of the um, DNA markers that we see on these individuals and any of the traits that we look at. So the females actually are kind of different in the way they look. Um, let me show you one female here. She's in her bag. Um, let's see. Can you see this female? Yeah. So you see that stripe on her back? Yeah. That stripe on her back can be pretty variable. So there are some females that have a solid line down the back, some of them that have almost diamond shapes, and some of them that have this like little notch pattern. Um, so those are things that might be under selection but we, ha we have no idea. And they might be genetically linked, but we are still, um, we're still trying to figure that out. Uh, but that's a good question. We'll know, we'll know if there are mutations that maybe cause differences in uh, the bodies of these lizards um, once we get those data collected. Um, how long has population, or how long has research been going on on the population of these lizards? Um, yeah, so research, we, or, well, I shouldn't say we, Dan um, started these populations in 2011. So each year they've been kind of uh, growing a little bit every year. Uh, I think they were started with 150 individuals, and now, you know, we've been out here um, on this island for four days catching, and we, <laughs> we've caught almost 550 animals here, and we're still seeing animals that we haven't marked. So what we do when we when we catch the animals, we bring them back to the lab and or our lab, which is really our rental house that's on the beach. <laughs> and we, um, you know, like I said, we weigh them and measure them, and then we put a little, um, like right on the their back hip. Um, I don't have one that's marked, but you know, right about there on the animal, right on his back, uh, on his back and hips. We put a little Sharpie marker with, um, we use Sharpie marker and make a like silver mark on it on their back, which shows up really well in the sunlight. So when we release them the day after we catch them, you can see the marked animals and the, and the ones that we haven't caught pretty easily in the field. Um, yeah. So uh, what have you found out so far about the natural selection? Like do larger males have a better chance of surviving? Um, so, larger males seem to be under selection, so this, we haven't actually, uh, there have been some studies here and some studies in the Bahamas, and they seem to, uh, on these lizards, because these lizards are actually invasive in Florida, um, their native range is the Bahamas, and that's where my lab, um, has their field base, um, but they, uh, it seems that males are under selection for large body size, 
but that females are under stabilizing selection, which if you guys remember, stabilizing selection means that there is an optimum size and females who are too large die and females who are too small die. So females kind of are uh, trying to be about a medium sized female, so, which is why they're so dimorphic, why you see males who are so big and females that are you know, not huge. Um, one of the reasons for that, we, fit, we hypothesized, because, um, is that females uh, produce an egg every 10 days. And these eggs, relative to your body, would be about the size of a basketball. So if you can imagine producing a basketball-sized offspring every 10 days, you can see why if females are investing a lot in growing to be really huge, they can't invest a lot in producing babies. So females are females grow to a size that is large enough that they can produce a lot of babies, but not too big that they're investing a lot in, in growing their body. They produce a lot, or they invest a lot of their energy into just producing babies. Um, so we haven't been uh, sampling here. So here, uh, the populations are just now stabilized. So they were introduced in 2011, and 2012 was kind of their first year, and they're growing a lot. Um, but we we haven't really seen anything happening here yet, just because they weren't. It wasn't an established population that we were walking into. They're they've been established probably about two years now, um, and we're. Uh, you know, really it's more that they, we have only been measuring traits like body size so far, but this year we're measuring a lot more traits. Um, so hopefully in the next two or three years, we'll be able to say a little bit more, but really it's been, we just see that there's selection for males to be larger and females to be about medium size. Uh, that's about, so, but hopefully if I call you guys again in a few years, I'll be able to tell you a little bit more about um, other traits that are under selection. Tell them about the pedigrees. Oh, right. So, um, so one of the things that we're going to do on this island um, to, uh, like I said, to measure sexual selection is take, we have DNA samples from all of the lizards that have ever been caught on this island. So that's over, I think, over 1,500 over the past few years. Some of them have obviously died. Um, but when we, when we have their DNA, we're going to um, do some pretty heavy uh, DNA analysis on each individual. And what we can do, if we know who is, uh, which ones are adult at certain time points, we can build pedigrees by looking at how related all of the individuals are. Um, so often we find that, uh, if that females, uh, females w will stay approximately whether they've been laid or where they were laid as eggs, but males will disperse. So. We might find on a bush that a bunch of females on, who live on a specific bush are all sisters or the, a mom and, and daughters, but the males are kind of all over the place, which is good because it prevents inbreeding, right? Um, but we're going to be able to determine um, who everybody is, how they're related, whether they're, you know, less distantly, whether they try and mate with uh, lizards who are less related to them or more closely related to them, which might not be the best thing to do. Um, and we will also, using that pedigree, um, you guys have probably made a pedigree uh, with your family looking at different traits and things like that, like hair color or stuff. Um, with that pedigree, we can also look to see how heritable traits are. So for body size in males, for example, it's really good for males to be large. We might be able to see whether um, whether that trait is heritable. So if selection is acting on a trait, uh, for large, you know, if, oh, if large males are at an advantage, the only way that, that change can occur in a population is if that male can pass on that same trait. So we can determine how heritable all of these traits are after we build this pedigree, which will probably take probably two years with the number of samples that we have. And that's going to be most of Aaron's dissertation and part of mine. How do you collect um, sperm cells from the male lizards? Sorry? How do you collect sperm cells from the male lizards? So I can't, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. There's a boat going by. How do you get the sperm? How do I, how do I get the sperm? So 
the males actually have a, um, from their testes, they have uh, a duct called the ductus deferens, which is similar to uh, the vas deferens in humans. Um, but their, their testes are internal and about halfway up their body. They're about the same place that kidneys are in humans. Um, so we, I can, you can actually just push on their stomach, and all lizards have a cloaca, which is, let me see, grab a lizard really quick, flip it upside down. Remember that word, we're um, going to see those in frogs later. Sorry? Cloaca. Sorry, I, I was talking to the kids, I told them to remember that word cloaca, because we're going to see it in the frogs later. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. so, eh, it's, it's hard, hard to hold a camera and pan a lizard. All right, so, so here's, here's the, the underside of a lizard. lizard. I don't know if you guys can see this very well. But, but on the underside of the lizard, there's a little hole, which is his butt. Um, it, but a cloaca is a kind of a generic hole. So everything comes out of it. Their poop, their pee, uh, their sperm, their babies, everything. Um, and you can actually just, when they're in reproductive mode with males, you can just push on their abdomen and uh, extract sperm that way. Um, so I, what I do is I extract the sperm and I do a sperm count for all the males to see how many cells he's producing. And then I take the cells and I use a fixative which uh, causes the cells to um, not break. So live cells, as you guys maybe know from osmosis, if you put live cells in like water or you let them dry, they burst. Um, but if you use something called formaldehyde, you can change fix the cell so that it doesn't burst, it, it becomes almost hardened, and then you can spread it on a slide and stain it. And then I, and then I use microscopy when I go back to Virginia to look at the cell, shell, the, the cell shape and size and look to see if those um, different parts of the sperm maybe help males achieve fertilization success. Uh, which I found in the lab, it seems like it matters uh, quite a bit. So uh, males who have who have uh, different parts of the cell are, that are slightly smaller and, and like if they have a long tail on their sperm, it seems like they have a fertilization advantage over some of the other uh, males that when they're competing against them. Um, how do you calculate how many cells are in, uh, in the sperm that you get from them? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, what you do is you take all of the cells and you put them in a known volume of liquid. So I put them into phosphate buffered saline, which is uh, usually called PBS, and that keeps them from bursting. And I put them in 500 microliters, and then I take a little bit of that um, and put it on a hemocytometer. So if you put it on a hemocytometer, you can, um, you can count the number of cells it's where, and you, the hemocytometer breaks the volume of the, of the liquid down into a known volume, so it's like 0 0.01 microliters. You count the number of cells that are in that space, and then you can back calculate based on the um, total volume that you had in your, uh, in your uh, tube. So for me, what I do is I count the number of cells in that square, and I multiply it by 5,000, which will give me how many cells were in that 500 microliters of, of solution. Yeah, good question. Cool. Well, I might take you guys to meet a few of my lab mates, if you guys want. Um, where did Aaron go? Hey, Aaron. I think they walked over to one of these palms. Aaron. Oh, they're chasing a lizard right now. Aaron, did you want to say something? Oh yeah, I sent them the blog spot. But you want to tell them about your research a little bit? Hi guys, my name's Aaron. Yeah, I think Ariel's probably covered a lot about the, the basic work here. I'll just say a little bit about what my specific uh, project of interest is about. So. The thing that I focus on is how natural selection is different for males and for females. And let me know if you covered any of this. So, if you, if you guys, um, have you guys studied evolution in your class at all? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know about natural selection and, and sort of the general idea of survival of the fittest. 
how some uh, animals in a population will have traits that will help them survive, and then they're going to pass those on to their kids, and over time, those traits that help you survive are going to be more common in the population. But there's an interesting problem that happens when the traits that make a male survive and leave behind a lot of kids are different from the traits that make a female survive and leave behind a lot of babies. So there's a conflict there, and I, I study that conflict, and it's called sexual conflict. Um, and I've been working on these islands since um, 2011, when Dan and I first put lizards out here, um, and we've been coming back uh, ever since. Yeah. Do you guys have any, any questions for me? So I, I couldn't quite hear. Was it when was when is the research season and when do you when are we down here? Yeah. So we uh, we're down here every year at the beginning of the breeding season before there are any new babies. We're trying to capture all of the potential parents for that season, um, and that usually happens at the very end of March or beginning of April, like this trip right now. And then we come back in July to catch all of the new babies and take uh, DNA samples from them so we can figure out who their parents are. And then we come again at the, in October, at the very end of the breeding season, to find out which adults uh, survive through the entire breeding season. How long does each trip last? So each trip takes um, anywhere from 7 to 15 days, is I think the range of our, our trips has typically been. With the, the spring trip and the October trip are usually two weeks, and then the, the summer trip has only been a week. Well, I'm going to pass back to Ariel, and I'm going to get back to catch more lizards. All right, thank you, Ariel. Sure. All right, guys. So, um, do any of you have any other questions for me? Yeah, I'm going to pass it back to Ariel. Thank you. 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 Thank you are pretty happy. Um, they're originally adapted for the Bahamas and, and, um, the, uh, and Cuba, but they seem to have slightly adapted a cold tolerance for Florida. Um, and so they do a lot better here. Um, people have, there have been some experiments that have been done to show that they have um, higher cold tolerance than the populations of the species in, um, in uh, the Bahamas. Um, but here, hurricanes do come through quite often, and uh, there have been some pop or some populations uh, not on these islands, but on you know other researchers' islands where a hurricane comes through and just wipes off all of the lizards on their islands. So um, that's always a concern. And there was a big storm this past fall. We were a little nervous that all the lizards might or a lot of the lizards might have died, um, but they were fine. So. Fingers crossed that we will have a big hurricane hit St. Augustine anytime soon. Yeah. yeah. How did you get yeah. into the program? Or like, how did you know what you wanted to do? How did, how did I know what I wanted to do? do? Is that what you said? Yeah, why don't you just talk a little bit about like, like, grad post, school? Yeah, like grad stuff and like, because, you know, some of these guys are going to be science majors later in a couple years, but I don't think any high school <laughs> really knows how the whole grad school situation works. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah I'll, Dan, Dan, I might come get, get you in a second, second if you want to talk to them. them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so I, actually I actually went to college um, because, because I wanted to be a medical illustrator. illustrator. Uh, so, so I went to, uh, to Oberlin, and I wanted to go there because they had a good biology program. I really liked biology, but I also really liked drawing. So, um, But as soon as I got there, I realized that biology was kind of what I wanted to do. Um, while, while I was at college, college I did some research in, a, in an ecology lab, and I just totally loved it. And it was super fun. We worked on crayfish and spent the summers in the field um, catching, or catching, crayfish. catching crayfish. And um, I thought that it was, I thought that field biology was just the best. <laughs> you know, your job is to go out into the field and, uh, you know, learn a lot about these um, species and then just tell everybody about how about the stuff you found. Um, I taught high school for a year after I graduated, and then, um, and you know, I love teaching, but I really wanted to teach college, so 
uh, which is why I'm at grad school now. I, um, I was teaching science and I liked it, but I really wanted to teach uh, like an evolutionary biology class. And so now I um, you know, applied to UVA to, and um, got in and then, you know, there I'm in my third year right now, so I'll probably graduate in, usually a PhD takes in, uh, for, for field, field biology, biology five or six years, years uh, depending, depending on whether your sites get hit by hurricanes or not. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so, so hopefully after I leave here, here I'll get a teaching job at a university, university or end up doing a postdoc somewhere, somewhere with uh, some, some researchers, and so, so we'll see. see. Um, so what exactly is the long-time goal? Like, what are you the long-time long goal is hopefully to be a professor. professor. Um, the long, I, I, really I really like teaching, um, but I also want to end up somewhere where uh, I can still do research, um, because I think that one of the things, when I was a student, that got me really excited about science was being able to do research while I was taking classes. So I want to um, go somewhere where I can still teach in the classroom, but also um, have students in my lab who are learning about evolution and about ecology by going out in the field with me and doing it. Um, and right now I've got four students who are working with me uh, back at UVA, and it's super fun. You know, they're all, they all, um, some of them, one of them is uh, coming to Miami and Puerto Rico with me to do some sampling this summer. Um, another one is, or both of them are hopefully also coming to Florida um, for the summer hatchling trip, trip down here. Um, so I encourage any of you who are interested in being bio majors in college to um, look, look to see who is um, looking for volunteers in their labs, um, especially if you ask early, because for me personally, when I am looking for um, students to work with me, um, I am looking, uh, students who are, you know, in their first or second year are really attractive, because to me that means, like, if I train you your first year, then I have, you know, you potentially three years where you are a trained student and you can maybe do something really cool in the lab where by your senior year, you might, might only be around for a few more months and you, you've you lost, lost the opportunity to do an independent project. project. So I, I, I would encourage you guys to do that. that. Five, Five minutes, minutes left. left. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, I, I think Dan wanted to say something to you guys, so I'll take you over. So Dan Warner is, like I said, the, um, the lead professor on this project, and he is at University of Alabama, Birmingham. Um, did you want to say something, Dan, or are you in hot pursuit? Okay, okay, here you go. This, this is my old high school. school. Oh, great. Uh, <laughs> hi, everyone. I'm Dan. Um, welcome to our islands out here in Florida. Where, um, uh, I'm not, I haven't been following everything that Ariel has been talking about, but uh, I'm assuming she's uh, explained quite a bit about the research that we're doing out here already. But um, really broadly, some of the things that I'm interested in out here on these islands is understanding how uh, natural, natural selection is acting on different phenotypes of lizards in these, po in these populations. And um, what I've been looking at over the last few years, years is how, uh, how selection on these different islands vary. Island, how selection varies in time. And uh, some of the preliminary results that I've been finding already is that uh, Sometimes, Sometimes selection is really strongly favoring large individuals in the population. And then sometimes, in other years, it favors smaller individuals, or sometimes it's really, really weak. It doesn't favor any uh, different, any size individual. It's just random. And I'm interested in understanding what's causing that variation. And one uh, interesting result that's come from this that I'm uh, I'm still trying to follow up on that I don't have a full grasp on it as, as the the density of the adult population, so the number of individuals per island, is just having a strong influence on the strength of selection on juvenile lizards. So what might be happening, uh, what, what our data show is that uh, when there's lots of adults around, particularly adult males around, the juvenile survival is relatively low. And when there's lots of adult males around, Selection on juvenile size, uh, there's well, a strong negative selection on juvenile size, meaning that smaller juveniles are being favored when there's lots of males around. 
And, and uh, I, I don't know exactly why, why that is, but one, one idea that we're hoping to test at some point soon is that maybe the ads are a strong collective force on the juvenile population. And, uh, and, uh, and we do see the adults, uh, well, they do, they've been known to cannibalize on the young, on the little ones. Uh, we've, uh, we've had them regurgitate little babies, we've seen some, some of the adults, adults actually eat the babies, uh, the adults, so there might be some sort of, um, um, sort of conflict, conflict between the adults and, and the young ones, and that's and something I'm really interested in following up on. Um, so that's, that's, that's Probably, probably what I'm interested, interested in is how selection is acting differently across these populations and how it varies through time. I'm also, I'm also interested very much in uh, sex ratio evolution. And one thing that we're looking at is how the sex ratios vary across the islands and through time, and how, and how that has influences on the uh, selection acting on different uh, sexually selected traits, like body size, the dewlaps of the males, for example. Um, so those are just a few things that uh, I'm interested in looking at, that we'll be looking at for Hopefully, Hopefully many, many decades, decades to come, come really tracking, tracking evolutionary change and, and, and patterns uh, through, through time and across, across many generations. generations. So, so. Alright, guys. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Was, was that the bell? bell? Yeah, that was yeah. the bell. Sorry. Thank you so Thank much. much. Thank you. Well, yeah. 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 Yeah.